right? So you come out of the Civil War, and as we come out of the Civil War, the good news is after the Civil War, then everybody just loves each other, right? No. It's not the history of America. I'm losing a pattern here. There is a pattern here. And so I'm, and I'm going to abbreviate this, but something, there is a pivotal event that changes and causes some real unity in America, and that happens in World War II. We go to war against totalitarianism, against fascism, against all the evils rolled into one, but it's a global war. It is truly a world war, and as a country, we all engage. Every color, every religion, every strata of society from rich to poor sacrifice. People are buying war bonds, people are recycling. Everybody knows boys who went away to the war. Most families lost people in the war. If your family didn't circle somebody you knew did, then the country was unified against an existential threat. Notice a common thread here, right? When there's an existential threat, we tend to unify. That's what human beings do. So there, there's an existential threat. We win that war. We come home. This is now considered one of the most prosperous storybook parts of American history. The 1950s. Right? This is where we get the phrase, the American dream. And people get the house in the suburbs and the white picket fence and a couple of kids. And, and we're living the dream. And by the way, that dream is available to almost everybody. And I don't want to paint a false picture. We have bad racism in the country. It's not like things were perfect in the country in the 1950s. But it is a relatively idyllic, peaceful, and prosperous period in American history. And then something unique starts to happen in the culture at that point. In the 1940s and into the 1950s, you get networks, these giant national networks broadcasting on television, right? And if you're old like me, and you might have grown up watching some of the reruns, maybe some of you are even a little bit older, but you get national shows like The Honeymooners, and Ozzy and Harriet, and Father Knows Best, and for you young people, they're all in black and white, you may have never seen this stuff, but these were the shows we were watching, and what it did for the culture is it made us feel the same. If you lived here in BB, you could watch these shows, and people in Manhattan were watching the same shows the same time. We begin to create a national culture. Not regional, not local, but national. National radio broadcasting does it too to some extent, but more once TV comes in. And you start to get national brands, right? You get uh, Borax Soap, you get Lucky Strike Cigarettes, some of the first big nationally known brands. And we move forward from the 1950s and start to grow into the national sports leagues. And we start to play sports together and root for sports together, right? So you have teams from the East Coast playing teams from the West Coast. We're all watching them on national TV or listening to them on national radio. We're building a veneer, what I call a veneer of national culture. And as you move forward into the 60s, the 60s are the heyday of franchising. Might be hard for you to think about this, but you know McDonald's is a relatively new phenomenon. And Wendy's and Carl's Jr. and Taco Bell and all these things that we see on every street corner, they were unheard of. Your town had its own burger joint, but the next town didn't have the same burger joint. Certainly the next state didn't have the same burger joint. So franchising changes the national culture. It affects not only food, but it affects grocery store chains. It affects gas chains, gas station chains. It affects hotel chains. Suddenly you have national brands that spread all across the country. It means by the end of the 1960s, I could be here in BB, and I could decide I'm going to drive to New York City. And all along the way, I could buy my gas from the same gas station. I could eat at the same restaurants all the way there. Back then, I could buy my Lucky Strike cigarettes each time I stopped at a gas station. And when I got to New York City, the food would not be entirely foreign to me. Nick, if you were from the country in the South and had traveled to New York in the colonial era, the food was different, the culture was different, the language was different, everything was different. Now I can go from the south to the north all the way, and there are things that will make me feel at home. We are one at that point in American history. The national motto, one of the national mottos, E Pluribus Unum, from many, one, seems to have come true. It seems like we're one big, happy family. Right? <laughs> Except when there's something weird going on at that time also in the culture. In the 1960s, you get the Vietnam War. And for those of you who were around then, you might remember this. Uh, I was born in 62, so I'm a little young, but you know, late 60s, you, you start to have all these, there's riots in the streets. 
People are literally throwing Molotov cocktails at police officers. Kind of seems like the summer of love in 2020, right? <laughs> Similar kind of feel. Drugs start to run rampant through our cities, and not just in the cities, but in small towns as well. Psychedelic drugs, pot, it's free love, sex, it's a rejection of religion, it's kind of all the new age stuff starts coming in in the 1960s. It's pretty crazy. I think of myself, if I had been older back then, if I had been the age I am now, I might have looked out on the country and I might have thought, I don't even recognize this country. What's the world coming to you? Some of you might be old enough that you recognize those thoughts and those feelings. You know, in the 1970s, if you jump forward 10 years from the 60s into the 1970s, it's the era of big government. One size fits all. Washington, D.C. really at a zenith of power at that point. And we'll do a little pop quiz here. I'm not a professor, but I play one on TV sometimes. So here's the pop quiz.